Uh, it was in, uh, I love Sister Phyllis. And I've known her now for 12, about 12 years. And, and uh, I love picking on her, and she knows that. She's able to give it back, I'll guarantee you. She grew up with some ornery brothers, some of whom I've met. I'll guarantee you she had to get tough to, to defend herself growing up. And it uh, comes with a tremendous family, but I, uh, she was showing out her grandkids' pictures back there in, in the fellowship hall. And there's actually pieces of paper about this big square. And I was joking with her that they actually make things now to you know, carry your pictures well written in and show to people. And uh, we got to joking about things. And, uh, and by the way, if you've got your phone in the service, I don't really care if you have your phone in the service as long as it's turned off so you don't receive calls. And remember, no texting during service, no playing games during service. And if I find out you're texting or playing games, you let the official pastor stare down before it's over with. And, uh, but I, I, I like technology. I wouldn't want to go back to living without it. And uh, I, I think it's so cool. Uh, I uh, was doing some research before service, just trying to get some numbers that I want to share with you. And instead of numbers as much, I'm going to share some letters as well. How many of you here have a smartphone? Let me just ask you that. Okay. Who has a TV at home? Monitor of some kind. Who has one that's 12 inches? 19. 26. 40 something. Anybody here got one of those big wall hugging 80? All right. Oh. You, you, think, you may think it's Spurgeon, but for his age, it'd be a Spurgeon. But at my age, having an 80 inch screen just might be a matter of survival. I remember we went from 19 inch uh, to a 46 inch three or four years ago. I could finally read the captions. Because before my family would have to read them, what's it saying, what's it saying, and my ears couldn't keep up with the conversation sometimes. So, anyway, I love the, the, what they can do on these screens. I've got a post it open. Jim's seen me use this here a few times. Uh, but I can just take this and I can write post it notes. I can go to Nars with it and just ask me what I should change. Just further change it. I'm like, no, I don't want to really change anything. But it's cool. Like, look at this. I can actually sit here and scroll through different notes. Isn't that cool? I've got all kinds of important stuff written on there, and I've got some nonsense written on there, too, just so they may have stolen They wouldn't think what was important while it was nonsense. But it's really cool. And, and to think about what has to take place for that to appear on that screen blows my mind because every little piece of color on there is a dot. It's a pixel. It's a, a piece of information. In order for you to show your grandkids pictures or your, your, your school project pictures or your work-related project or whatever it may be, for you to show it on there, there has to be a lot of pixels lit up to the right color. And if it moves, if you take your iPhone and you drag your icon from one screen to the next, all those pixels have to move in unison. And it's so much easier to see stuff like that nowadays than it used to be. I mean, when I was a kid, it was uh, snowy black and white pictures. Yes, I can remember those. And I remember going to a bigger screen that was black and white, and then a, a nicer one, a little sharper, and it actually had color. And in case you've ever gone to a movie, the reason it's called a movie is because it used to be still pictures, and they made them move, and so now it was movies. The pictures move across the screen. Amazing. But all those little pixels just going here and there. And you know what would ever happen if your processor just fried? Your graphics controller just quit doing what it's supposed to do? You might go to drag your icon and it might split into pieces. It might not move. It might move and you may move your finger this way and it goes somewhere else. Pastor, are you trying to wow us with technology this morning? No. But I want you to understand that sometimes I think our lives are very much like those pictures on your screens. And that our lives are a complex representation of a lot of different pieces of information. But Jim, I want you to go with me, if you will, this morning and put Mark chapter 6, verse 30 up on the screen. We're going to read through verse 41. But in order for a picture to be seen, 
a lot of pieces of information that got to be processed. And for that picture to make any sense, something's got to control it so that when you scroll through and you move it, it all stays together and you don't lose the picture that's supposed to be there. This morning, I feel like God's been, for a while really, this is really, tonight is part two of what I preached on Thursday night. I, I've been feeling the need for the miraculous to take place. And I know that in order for God to work a miracle, there's a lot of different pieces of information. There's a lot of different circumstances, if you will, that need to come together. One of them we just sang about, and that was you make yourself available. <clears throat> but this morning, I want to just put the help of the Lord for a little while. Talk about how that we need God to, to take the pieces of information in our life, the, the pixels, how we need Him to put them all together in a way that makes sense. And in order to do that, He has to work a miracle. Mark chapter 6, verse 30. Then the apostles gathered to Jesus and told Him all things, both what they had done and what they had taught. Just roll on through it. He said to them, Come aside by yourselves to a deserted place and rest a while. Now, before I go any further, Thursday night I began talking and I preached on the fact that it's never too late for God to do a miracle. Uh, I could have titled it other things, but we looked at a text where a woman had had a physical problem 18 years. And after 18 years of wrestling with that unfortunate situation in her life, she came in contact with God, made herself available. God spoke to her, touched her, and fixed her problem even after 18 long years. And this morning I'm picking up with that same theme right here where the disciples had been ministering and Jesus sends them to a deserted place. Uh, in, in the translation I was reading, it said a desolate place. It was a, a lonely place, or it should have been anyway, a place where they could get away from it all and just rest and, and kick their heels up and, and relax for a while. And it says there were many coming and going and they didn't even have time to eat. They were so busy doing the work that they had been called and commissioned to do that they just didn't have the time to take care of the necessities. Now I understand that when we look at the disciples this morning, we're actually talking about preachers. And I know I'm not speaking to a congregation full of preachers this morning. But I dare say that in this room here this morning, there's been many times that we as adults have felt like there was so much that was going on in our lives, so much that was coming and going and moving this way and the other, that we really just didn't even have the time to take care of business. Can somebody say amen? Well, the Lord sent them to a place where they could get rest. Next verse. So they de departed to a deserted place in the boat by themselves. Hello, vacation. I know I, I, just a few weeks ago I was sharing how my wife and I were looking at trailers and fifth wheels because, you know, it's our 25th anniversary this year. We're hoping to, to take a few trips this year and see some things we've never seen before. To, some folks do cruises. We decided to cruise the highway. And uh, anyway, we're still dreaming. But they departed. But the multitude saw them departing, and many knew Jesus, Him. And He ran there on foot from all the cities, and they arrived before them and came together to Him. Next verse. And Jesus, when He came out and saw a great multitude, was moved with compassion for them because they were like sheep not having a shepherd. So He began to teach them many things. We're going to go ahead and read through it now that I'll come back. When the day was now far spent, His disciples came to Him and said, This is a deserted place. And already the hour is late. Send them away that they may go into the surrounding country and villages and buy themselves bread for they have nothing to eat. But he answered and said to them, You give them something to eat. They said to him, Shall we go and buy 200 denarii worth of bread and give them something to eat? A little sarcasm in their voice, I think. And he said to them, How many loaves do you have? Go and see. And when they found out, five and two fish. 
And then he commanded them to make all sit down in groups on the green grass. And so they sat down in ranks in hundreds and in fifties. Next verse, and we'll call it quits. Hello, next verse. There we go. And when he had taken the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven, blessed and broke the loaves, and gave them to his disciples, and set before them and the two fish, he divided among them all. I said next last one, let's go a little bit further. Verse 42, let's go ahead. And so they all ate and were filled. So let's just stop right there. I want to bring some things out this morning as I try to go through this passage with you and just take a look at some things. I've already mentioned in verse number 31 that they were sent to a place that was desolate. That's uh, deserted. I want you to know it's not always a bad thing to get to a place that doesn't have a lot going on. It's not always a bad thing to be sent somewhere to take a rest or to take a getaway. It's not always a bad thing to be sent somewhere where everything doesn't seem to be happening. I know my kids, uh, they always told me they wanted to move to a big city where there was always something going on. And I always want to move further out to the country where there's nothing always going on. I would rather just never hear the sound of a siren than it to every once in a while hear the sound of a siren. But the, the Lord sent them to a, a desolate place. But if you notice in verses 33 through 35, and this is where we stopped reading together and going through it, when they got to that desolate place, people had noticed where they were going and people had scooted there ahead of them. And so when he, they got there to this place that was supposed to have been a, a place of rest and relaxation, a place for them to recuperate and sit down and get a good meal and, and plan their next evangelistic journey or their next work task, whatever the case may be, when they got there, the, the plan had already been thwarted. People had already interfered with what God's perfect plan for them was. Now I'm going to mess with your theology here for a second. But God's will is not always done. Hello? This is planet earth. This isn't heaven. The Lord said to pray, Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Why is that? Because if we don't pray God's will be done, God's will ain't going to be done. Because God is not controlling things down here. I'm messing with your theology. I know God's still supreme. But right now, Satan is called the prince of the power of the air. He's called the God of this world. And we live in a world that shows the signs of evil influence everywhere. Amen, Brother Duncan. That's good preaching. Just this last weekend, if you listen to the news at all, there was a lady here in our country who was not only killed at her workplace, but she was beheaded. And then as the police later gave a news conference, Muslims gathered around and shouted, Praise Allah! We're not talking about Iraq. We're not talking about Baghdad. We're not talking about Lebanon or somewhere, uh, uh, you know, Yemen. And we're not. Ta we're talking about here in Oklahoma, I believe it was. There's the influences of evil all around us. Sin and, and bad choices and evil hearts uh, and mean spirits. Uh, all these things and just human beings being what human beings are. We see all the influences of evil around us. And church, if we ever lived in a day and age in which people needed God to say, Hey, I hear you calling. I need to intervene for you. We live in that age right now. Amen. Amen. And they got to a situation, a place where God told them to go to get some rest. But when they got there, they couldn't get any rest. I'm here to tell you this morning, God has a plan for everybody in this room. But God's plan isn't always going to unfold the way that He would like for it to. Because the devil, the enemy, other people sometimes are going to interfere. Have you ever laid a plan, made, made plans to do something, and it just didn't work out? You know, people, finances, situations, things happen that stopped from happening what should have happened. Well, the disciples got themselves in one of these kind of situations. They they got somewhere that was supposed to have been good for them and it turned out to be just more stress. Now I can sympathize with that and probably most of you can't hear this morning as well. 
There may be times that God has something in plan for you that He desires it to be a thing of peace. And when you get there, it's not as peaceful as it should be. And maybe no fault of your own. Sometimes it is, no doubt. I'm first to admit that I've messed things up in my life at times. But many times God sends us somewhere and the enemy will either directly or indirectly and say, ah, I'm going to mess up God's plan. He, he wants him to get some rest. He wants him to, to have some good things. He wants him to have some blessings. And he'll do what he can to interfere with that. And it usually comes through the intervention of people. And they got to a place where they just couldn't handle it. They see you know what's late. They're getting hungry. And Lord, we just we need to send these people away. Let's get them out of here. Now, I, I know you've heard the teaching and heard preaching about the 5,000 being fed many times before. So I know I'm not sharing or breaking new ground with you this morning. But have you ever been in a place where you just say, God, get rid of it all? Where people were bothering you and you just want to say, God, send them away? Have you ever had people at your job irritating you and you're like, God, can you just move them on out of here? Promote them out? Fire them out? Clean them out? I don't care how, but get them out? You kids may have thought that about your parents at times. You don't really want that to happen. Parents may have thought it about the kids at times. It will happen sooner or later when they get grown up. I really wish they were coming back. They were here and said, Lord, should we send them away? They're hungry and we don't have anything for them to eat. Verse 35 and 36. Put that back up there if you would. I want to take a moment and look at that. Verses 35 and 36. When the day was now far spent, his disciples came to him and said, It's a deserted place and the hour's late. Keep rolling. Send them away that they can go into the surrounding country and build and buy themselves bread for for they don't have anything to eat. Keep it rolling. But he answered and said to them, You give them something to eat. And they said to him, Well, what are we going to do? Go buy 200 bucks worth of bread and, and give them something? Paraphrase there. Next verse. He said to them, How many loaves do you have? Let's stop right there. Church this morning, I've got a few simple things I want to drive home to you. If you need a miracle in your life this morning, I know as a pastor, many times you know situations, but there are many times there are situations that I'm not aware of. I'm speaking to those I do know and those I don't know this morning. But I believe I'm talking to people this morning that may feel like they're in a place where they desperately need God to intervene somehow. You have reached the end of your rope, your resources, and you don't really know which way to turn. And you wonder just what you should do. And maybe you've tried talking to God. Maybe you've thought to God. Maybe you've had feelings to God. And in your mind and your heart, it's been kind of a, Lord, what do you want me to do about it? Lord, there's nowhere I can turn. Well, I want to first of all point out that what they did was the right thing. First of all, when they realized they had a problem, they at least went to God. The church, you hear me what I'm going to say right now because if you don't leave with anything else I say this morning, if you tune me out till now, that's okay. Tune in for the next 30 seconds and then if you feel like you must, tune me out again. But hear what I'm going to say in the next 30 seconds. God will respond to you if you will call on Him. He doesn't respond just to thinking about it. He doesn't respond to well wishes about Him. He doesn't respond to just warm fuzzy thoughts about God. But if you will sit down on your knees somewhere and actually use your God-given voice and your God-given mind and you will call on the name of Jesus Christ, God will hear your prayer. He doesn't respond to doing the hokey pokey where they're wearing leathers and feathers. He doesn't respond to well-meaning chants and burning incenses and, and lighting candles everywhere. He doesn't respond to special music and good recitations. He doesn't respond to changing beats and position on a, a, on a string. He doesn't respond to all that kind of stuff. You can't lead your house over to God and get His attention. Neither can you crawl on a bed of nails. I read recently, I'm not knocking it, but you know, God could care less if I could lay on a bed of nails and have someone jump up on my chest and get the book of records. It doesn't get God's attention. 
if you've got a problem and you need God to help, don't bother telling your neighbor. Don't bother telling your, your friend. I mean, there's nothing wrong with it, but that's not the answer. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord. So lift up your eyes to the hills. Excuse my voice cracking there, but lift up your eyes to God and say, God, I need your help. That's right. That's right. When you're feeling over, Lord, there's two, what? Go give them 200 and there. God, give all our resources and fill their mouths. You know what? That's not the answer because it won't be enough. There's times that you need what only God can do. And so what God did say, what did God say to them? What do you have? Go and see. When they found out. You know what this little this little exchange here tells me? What it tells me they didn't know what they had. Because they had to go find out. Well, boys, you got a problem here. What are your resources? Well, uh, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Well, go and find out. I, I don't know that Jesus was frustrated. If it had been us, we'd been frustrated. Go and see. And when they found out, they said five and two fish. Now, a couple more things come out to me from this little exchange here. They're dialoguing with God, and God's already kind of, I think, in a way, chastised them. Go see how many loaves you have. And so they go off and they start looking, they start checking, and, and they find out how many they have, and they come back and they say, Five and two fish. And, and in their mind, they didn't come back. It doesn't say they came back shouting or rejoicing, Five and two fish, but I can see that they probably came back. Oh, we got five loaves. And. Uh, <clears throat> Two fish. I don't think that they were convinced that they had enough. I don't think that they were in any way convinced that they had enough. But they came back with that answer. And at this point, they're still convinced that the problem is insurmountable. And so then the story goes on. Next verse. Verse number 39. He commanded them all to sit down in groups on the green grass. Now, I've wondered about that. Why did he make them sit down? I've got some ideas on that. And it's just my guesses. I'll share it with you anyway. But I'll hang on to it just for another minute. Then what did he do next? They sat down in ranks, hundreds and fifties, sorted everything out, saw exactly how many people need to be fed. And then the next verse, he took what they had, looked up to heaven, and he prayed. And then he told them to start passing it out. Now I made a few little notes here. And we'll share it with you. It won't take long. But if you if you got a problem that you need God to help you with, I think that there's some steps that Jesus illustrated here. Now understand, they, the disciples did good. They called on Jesus first. But they didn't really feel like they had the answer. They didn't come to Him and say, Jesus, we've got five loaves and uh, two fishes, and how are we going to make this thing work here, Lord? They didn't come to Him with what they had and say, here, Lord, help us to make this stretch out. And they, they knew what God could do, but they didn't take what they had and put it in His hands. They came to Him just complaining about the problem. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands of anybody here that's done more complaining than praying because we'd all have our hands in the air waving. But the Lord here... When they came to him with the problem, and when God intervened and he told them to start doing stuff, he, first of all, organized them. Well, let me back up. That was actually the first thing he did was go take inventory. What do you have? Loaves and fishes. Two and, or five and two. Not much, but here's what I got. <clears throat> then he told them to organize it. Spread them out. Group them by numbers. 
Do you realize that you can get so caught up in the emotion of a problem that you really lose sight of what the problem is? You can get so caught up in the emotion of feeling overwhelmed or feeling that uh, you, you, you're not going to make it, a, a feeling that you're, you're hopeless or lost. or You can get so caught up in the negative feelings that surround problems that you can lose sight of what God is able to do with just a very little. And so this morning, I believe that when we come to God with our problems, He wants us to take inventory and see what we have. Church, let me tell you this morning, there's not a soul in this room that doesn't have something to offer to God. Amen. That's right. There's not a person in this room this morning that doesn't have talents and abilities that they could use for the kingdom of God in some way. They don't have... There's not a person in this room other than the little infants uh, who aren't old enough to take what talents they have uh, and use them some way for God. And those of us who are a little bit older, who are living our own lives as adults now, and, and we're making our own choices and living with our own consequences, uh, and maybe some of us have made a few mistakes and we've got, us in the, uh, got ourselves in binds. Amen. I know I've been there. Yeah, I think I keep a second address there sometimes. Can I tell you this morning, there's not a problem that you face and there's not a problem that I face that God is not able to take what is in our hands right now and use it to turn or make a turn around. That's right. Praise the Lord. That's right. What did not happen was the Lord say, how much do you have? And they go to the crowd and come back and say, Lord, all we got is uh, two fishes and uh, a couple of yeah, some loaves of bread and here I go fishing. Lord, I'm, we're searching, Lord. We're trying to find some more resources here. Uh, but you know what? When they had emptied their pockets and they didn't have any other resources, the Lord didn't look at them and say, that, that's not enough. I need something more to work with. That's right. That's right. Come on. He said, Give me what you got. Yes. I like that. You know what? God's not looking for you to be something that you ain't. That's right. God's never asked me to sing like a singer because He knows I can't. He's called me to be me. He's called you to be you. And the Bible's promise He'll never put more on you than you're able to handle with His assistance. And so whatever you're going through this morning, you need to do a sincere, honest inventory. Don't come to God and act like you got it all together because He knows different. And don't come to God being mealy-mouthed and saying, God, I ain't got anything because that ain't true either. But come to Him and say, God, what i got is Yours. And so the Lord, after He had them take an inventory of what they had. He had them spread everything out and organize and take a real look at the problem. You know what I have found out many times in my life? When I needed something, I found out that maybe I had what I needed. I just didn't know where I'd put it. Come on. <clears throat> now, I don't know if any of you younger guys in here will appreciate this. But I know one over here that will. But I've got a garage over there that I've dreaded to go through because... Part of the, there's one table over there, and I know when I go through it, I want to find multiples of some cheap tools that I needed one at some point in time and couldn't find it, and just went out and replaced it for two or three bucks, and now I've got two of them. And then Caleb, somewhere along the way, I failed to find one of those two, and I went out and replaced it with a third one. Wow. And so you tell me why Pastor has three. Screwdrivers that are exactly the same with the same brand, not different sizes, same stinking thing. Why? Because over 20 years he didn't always have it together and always always know where it was. I'm telling you here this morning, sometimes church, God had them organize things because he wanted them to know exactly what they were dealing with. And when he got done with them, they knew exactly what they had and they knew exactly what they needed to do. And my friend, in our lives, many times that's half the battle. If God can get us to open our eyes to see what resources he has already laid inside of us, all the latent talents and abilities and, and mindsets and personalities that he's put inside of us. 
us. If He can get us to take an honest look at ourselves and take an honest look at our situations. Now, I will give you this. Laying all the resources out, plopping the two fish and the loaves of bread in front of Jesus and sitting everybody down in the crowd in groups didn't feed them. And the inventory and the organization didn't solve the problem. But then Jesus here modeled what we should do. He looked up to heaven. But the church, whole church here knows how many times I say over and over and over the Bible says stretch your hands out to heaven. Lift your eyes up to heaven. That's why I'm always saying lift your hands up to the heavens right now. Lift your hands up to God. He looked up to heaven. And He prayed over what was there. <coughs> I said it first. I meant to be kind of funny. I don't know if everybody laughed or not. But when I said that God doesn't you respond to prayers with you know, if you're dressed in leathers and feathers, I've got a picture of my mind of the Indians doing them. You know, he doesn't get his attention. He's not out for a holy hokey pokey to get his attention. But what he's looking for is for somebody that will be sincere with him and say, God, I need your help. Yes. That's right. Now, do you understand here? Before Jesus really got involved in doing anything, I mean, they came to him, they prayed in the beginning. Before God really did anything, He made them get themselves together. Hello? Come on. You young couples, can, they, they will attest to it. I can And over the years, I've told probably hundreds of people, you know what? you got to work on you first. Right. Because God holds you accountable for you. You're not responsible for what mom and dad does. But you know what? You're going to stand before God for what you do. And I'm not saying he's anything bad. It's not why I picked him out. But God's dealing with you. He's got to pay it for you. Before God intervened with the miraculous, he made them do what they could do first. Have you ever jokingly said? What you said? What you said? Oh dear God, bless this mess. I love that saying that's floating around out there. It's been around for a few. I just love not my monkeys, not my circus. I love it. I think sometimes we call on God with that. Maybe you don't say it out loud, but in your mind you're just like, ah, it's a problem. Fix it, God. Bless this mess. And I think somewhere up in heaven, God leans back and says, not my monkeys, not my circus. <laughs> you say you don't care? No. But I'm saying He's not going to do what you are supposed to do. Because they should have already tried to figure out how many people they had to feed. They didn't know until they spread them out and counted them. They should have already figured out how much food they actually had to give. They didn't know. But they come to it with the problem. God, what are we going to do? we got to be all these people. How much do you have and how many are there? Uh. Well, go find out and sit everybody down and count put them in groups of 50, put them in groups of 100, and let's figure it out. And then when they come back, and then you can call this, Lord, we know what you said. This is all we've got. We still, there, there's just a whole bunch of them, and we're tired, by the way. We came here to rest, and we didn't ask for all these problems, and you sent us here, God. Remember that you sent us here, and here's this mess, and here's this problem, and, and what are we going to do? And then, Jesus said, okay, we praise And I'll tell you what did not happen. Fish did not start 
a period all on the ground there beside those two that they had. I don't know if they had them on a stringer, if they were in a basket or what, but fish did not just start piling up. Loaves of bread did not just start appearing out of nowhere. But what God told them to do really probably didn't make a whole lot of sense to them. Because after He told them to go get what they had and let's get everybody counted here, He said, okay, now take what you got and start passing it out. With that crowd and those resources, it didn't make a lick of sense. The faith comes by hearing. And hearing by the Word of the Lord. And faith without obedience is dead. And so the Lord basically was telling him, okay, now if you want to see something done, you're going to have to act in faith. I want to test your obedience Get those fish and get those bread, loaves of bread, and start passing them out. And, and I don't doubt that in, in a crowd of people, there's always going to be some. You know, probably, there's probably some disciples. Are, okay, great, God's going to do something. There's always someone that's got that positive attitude. I'm not that person, but there probably was. But there was also probably some of the year, right? Look, what's it? Him doesn't. I think he's lost it. He's stressed out. It's just not enough. And they were probably grumbling underneath their bread, their bread as they're walking over to the first person. And they, they're, they're probably breaking off pieces of bread and handing out pieces of fish, still grumbling.